mercy and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our message today is drawn from our gospel lesson. I read again Mark 10, verse 18. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. In the text that I just read, we have a little snippet from a conversation. And you recall it from uh, the gospel lesson. It was, it was read in full. A young man approaches Jesus and calls him good teacher. And this, of course, brings forward the question, what is good? A modern dictionary might give you some of these following definitions for the noun. Profit or advantage, worth, like that was a good deal. Excellence or merit, even kindness, like uh, that is a good car, an excellent car. Or moral righteousness, the third one, moral righteousness of virtue, like that is a good man. You know, it's these ideas may indeed reflect what our culture and our society consider good, but they don't capture the concept out of the Bible. You see, they are all too relative or don't apply at all. Good in the Bible is not, never is, self-serving, like the idea of a prophet or an advantage might imply. The idea of excellence or merit is so often twisted by humans that it simply doesn't work at all. For example, on these two uh, definitions, we may speak of an excellent business deal where we take advantage of somebody who is in dire economic straits and has no other options. Or a politician may think that a strategy to smear his opponents has merit. And as the political season comes up, you will discover just about every politician thinks it's a good idea to smear their opponent. Human kindness only goes so far. Typically, not very far. Just think of all the unkind things people are saying in our town right now about the refugees that are settling here. Human kindness really has limits. Moral righteousness and virtue seem to be an even worse comparison. Abortion is defended in our country as a virtue. Homosexual Marriage is defended as moral. California has jumped on the American morality bandwagon and just passed a law legalizing assisted suicide. Pornography is defended as freedom of speech. And in our country, the ultimate good is freedom of speech, it seems. It just so often seems that righteousness for humans is simply another word for no restraint, licentiousness. There is nothing new about this way of thinking or understanding the word good. In the 1940s, it seemed like a good idea to murder all the Jews in Germany, didn't it? In the 1920s, it seemed like a good idea to involuntarily sterilize all the mentally handicapped people in the United States. In the first two decades of the 20th century, it seemed like a good idea to the Ottomans to murder all of the Christian Armenians in their empire. In the 1800s, it seemed like a good idea to drive all the Native Americans from their lands here in North America. 
And you want to know how far back this goes? In the Garden of Eden, it seemed like a good idea to eat fruit from the forbidden tree. I could go on with more good ideas from history or current events, but you get the idea. When it comes to the word good, we simply don't have a clue as humanity. We can't help but think that the words that Isaiah wrote for his generation, he could have easily been writing for ours as well. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. With humanity's lack of understanding, it is not surprising that Jesus asked this young man, why do you call me good? While we could point to all kinds of things that we think are good, Jesus reminds us that only God is good. To be good, then, is to be like God. Not God in the sense of all the idols that are worshipped in our country today, but the one true triune God, the God of the Bible. He is the standard for what is good. The real God values life. So good is to value life. It is not to kill, it is not good then to kill the unborn, the aged, the infirm, or others whom society falsely undervalues. It is not good to lift up mass murderers working outside the law as heroes in the movies. How easy we forget that the lives of the refugees that are, have moved into our areas are just as precious to God as your life and my life. In fact, God himself says, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat him. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourselves. For you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God created marriage with a man and a woman. It is not good then for a man to marry a man, or a woman to wear, marry a woman, or a man to marry multiple women, or a woman to marry multiple men, or to get a divorce. Pornography is not good. Nudity in the movies is not good. And I don't care how many voices in the culture say it's art. It is not good. So when this young man calls Jesus good, Jesus reminds him that only God is good. Notice that Jesus doesn't say that the man is wrong. Indeed, Jesus is good. In accepting this description then, Jesus reminds us that he is God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord of the Church, the Everlasting One, and all those other wonderful titles that the Bible gives God. He is the one who shows the compassion Humanity so often lacks. The love for one's neighbor, we parse out so carefully the mercy that all human humanity needs, Jesus gives. That compassion which passes all human understanding. Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's goodness towards us to all humanity. So St. Paul wrote to the Romans, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, 
shall we be saved by his life. This is our good God in action. He redeemed us even though we did not want a redeemer. He justified us even when we did not want to be justified. And he offers us his precious compassion and love through his word. He communicates it and grants it to us through the waters of baptism. He attaches it to his life-giving body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Yes, our good God is so good that we fallen sinners really don't comprehend it. However, we receive his goodness by grace through a spirit-worked faith. So we rejoice. He, give, he gives us forgiveness and new life, not based on our goodness, but because he is good. He is the only one, in fact, who is truly good. But our good God does not grant us his goodness so that we can return to evil ways. We certainly are not, are not to be the embodiment of what Peter wrote when he wrote what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dogs return to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing itself, returns to wallow in the mire. We are called to walk in newness of life, being God's light in a sin-darkened world, sharing his love, sharing his goodness. Now, you maybe notice that today happens to be the commemoration of Philip the Deacon. And it just so happens that this saint is an excellent example of what I'm talking about. Philip, who was also called the Evangelist, was one of the seven men appointed to assist in the work of the twelve apostles in the apostolic church in the book of Acts when the church is growing by leaps and bounds. And these deacons had oversight over the distribution of the food and other things for the poor and the needy in the community. To put that another way, he was a layman, like y'all, and he was selected by the church to fulfill an office, just like we have officers and board members, president, board of evangelism, and all this kind of stuff. Skip ahead a couple of years, and Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church. And a lot of, church, a lot of Christians decided Jerusalem was not necessarily the healthiest place to stay. And so they all began to move away, except for the apostles who continued to preach in the city. And Philip was one of those who decided it was time to move on. And he goes to, of all places, Samaria, where he shares the life-giving gospel. And one of the people that became a Christian was a fellow named Simon, who was a sorcerer. And uh, so you see the gospel claiming people from the very pits of hell. Somebody who, who had made a deal with the devil has that deal broken by the gospel. Philip was also instrumental in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, a officer in the court of Candace. So indirectly, he was also responsible for the spreading of the gospel to Africa. New, uh, by his work as a deacon, Philip demonstrates that he understands the mission of mercy that Christ has given to the church. By his work with the Samaritans and the Ethiopians, we can see that Philip has a good grasp of the idea that the gospel is for all people, not just for Jews. After uh, the uh, conversion of the uh, Ethiopian fellow, uh, he starts moving about a little bit, and everywhere he goes, he shares the gospel. Uh, he, the book of Acts says he 
covered all the towns between Azotus northward to Caesarea, where he took up residence with his four daughters. And by the way, Philip's wife, he had to have a wife because he had four daughters, right? Uh, but his wife is never mentioned, so it is generally assumed that she died before he becomes a deacon. And people dying was, you know, a much greater part of reality back then. In Caesarea, Philip was the host for several days of the Apostle Paul and his company as they are traveling down to Jerusalem. Now that's the last that we have about Philip in the Bible, and so it, there's a certain amount of speculation, you might say, about how the later part of his life works out. But uh, Basil, who was a 4th century bis bishop of Caesarea, said that Philip was the bishop of Trallus in Lydia and Asia Minor. And in case you don't know your map very well, Asia Minor is where uh, the country of Turkey is today. Therefore, it seems likely that he became a called and ordained pastor, to use today's terminology, and uh, continued the church's ministry of mercy and sharing the life-giving gospel to the end of his days. Philip was a good man. But he would be the first to confess that his goodness was an alien goodness, not an intrinsic goodness, something that was innate within him. His was a goodness given to him by God, a goodness granted by grace, the same goodness God grants to all his children, a goodness that worked out in his life. We are called to the good life as well. That doesn't mean, though, a life dedicated to beautiful homes, fast cars, large bank accounts, or for fulfilling some thrill-seeking bucket list. The good life we are called to is a life that expresses the goodness of God, his love and mercy. It is a life where whatever gifts God has given you, whether they are financial or mental abilities or physical abilities or something else, anything, we dedicate them to the Lord. We dedicate them to share God's love in Christ Jesus. The professional athlete that uses his fame to confess Christ is living the good life no matter how much rejection the athlete may receive for thus speaking. The poor widow who puts her two mites in the offering plate is also living the good life no matter how much our culture overlooks that her. Yes, Jesus is right. Only God is good. But thanks be to God that he grants us his goodness through the means of grace. So endowed, we reflect God's goodness in what we say and what we do. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.